Hey, man. How are you? I, well, you know, I'm doing pretty good, all things considered. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Hey, I got to, I, I just got into the, uh, the uh, mental, the mental challenge or whatever thing. So thanks for calling me out. I'll, I'll, I'll be getting a message out. So I appreciate that a lot. I really do. You look great, by the way. Good God. You know, I mean, I just, I remember the, the second time I saw you at, you know, at, um, at uh, Neverland after having seen you the first time, you, I mean, you've just really shaved it off. Um, very impressive in the business casual, though, doing the, the blockies. That was very impressive. I was like, look at this guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I, now that one, I was like, you're going to drop the coupon on your foot. You know that, right? <laughs> I was like, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> no, that Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the Hot Cruising Monthly Webinar ser Series. Uh, today's webinar is the fourth S and I'll be going through all that. I wanna welcome everybody that, though today. If you're in the St. Louis area, it's a beautiful day. The Union Jack is flying somewhere in the world. So um, we're ready to get started today. Um, today, we're gonna talk about what business succession really means. Um, we're gonna talk about building on the four S's. And we're going to hopefully answer any questions you have as we go along. If you don't get your question answered, though, please use the Q&A function, use the chat function, send us an email. Um, if you want, if you don't want to answer, you know, don't want a, a general question, you want some specifics, we'd love to um, get that done for you. Um, Catherine Cruz, is sitting back here in the wings, uh, ready to receive those questions. Every so often, I'll stop or she'll just tell me to stop. And uh, I'll answer any questions that you have. So please do not be uh, bashful whatsoever. Um, so we're going to get started here this morning. Um, we've already been the, through the three S's. Um, so we're going to summarize those a little bit. Probably got about an hour's worth today of uh, questions. Um, if I can get us done quicker, obviously we'll get her done quicker. I hope that that means that there's a lot of interaction. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of boring stuff over the next 45 minutes. So we're going to talk about the three S's. Those are the three things we've already been through. We're going to talk about what succession and sale means. We're going to start defining some really key terms that your, um, that your business clients and that businesses need to know when it comes to either selling or succeeding their business, that transition phase. Um, so hope I'm not unmuted. Hope I'm not muted. Um, somebody tell me if I'm talking and you can't hear me. Um, so this is our agenda sitting here in front of us. Let's get started. We're going to move forward. We've talked about the startup, the structure, and the simulation. Those are these, these are the identifiers of each one of those stages. Now, and those are the really hard stages. You know, you got to know your why. Have you created a business plan? Have you tested it with a budget? Because that's all critical stuff. Um, we've been through how do I select an entity and what makes sense from the tax type? And when you remember, 
Most entities are going to be LLCs, limited liability companies. And then that, engage, that enables me to choose from four different really tax types, S Corp, corporation, partnership, sole proprietorship. Um, we now, because we vetted that business plan, we have a really good idea what those key performance indicators are. Do those things, we are successful. Fail on those things, we have a different problem, different mindset. And then finally, we've got a dashboard so that management can make changes very quickly, especially if you look at the last 24 months, 19, the rocket ship just really blaring, 20, we hit COVID, lots of challenges in COVID. Now here we are entering into 21, no mask orders coming out, lots of things, business is changing again, um, and we're hoping that the economy remains strong. So this is where we've been, We've started it, we've structured it, we've tested it. Now what do we do? We have to plan for where we're going. We don't all build a business for nothing. We build a business normally for the lifestyle and also probably we're building it to thinking that we're gonna pass it on. Are we passing it on to our family? Are we passing it on to someone else? Either way, it's the reason we're doing it is because um, we're building wealth for ourselves in our retirement. So, so now that's not your why, by the way. I, I started with your why and, and our, in the next month, we're gonna go back over this again. We're gonna start talking about what is your why? Do you have to know your why? So I don't wanna, don't wanna gloss over that too much. So succession or sale, and this pretty much says it all. What am I doing next with the business for retirement? What is my transition plan? Um, and these are some key values that are very important for my small business clients to know and understand because too often, one of two things happen. Um, I have seen a lot of really good businesses just close down, just close down. I'm retiring, going out of business. You see it all the time. I'm retiring, I'm done, going out of business. You've built this wonderful synergy and we're just gonna turn it off, okay? That's, to me, that's a little bit of a waste. So if I can get my small businesses to start thinking about what should I do with it? Can I transition it? Not necessarily to family, Maybe I don't have any family that wants it. Maybe I have some of my team members that would be terrific in it, enabling me maybe to help foster that and train them into that, um, into that next role. So transition is a really good key, not necessarily sale or succession, but transition. So am I going to new management or ownership um, internally or externally? And those are all key, key elements. So here's a few of the facts. 76% of owners are going to transition in the next 10 years. That's a ton, that's a lot. So there's a lot of businesses out there. If you have a plan, it's like we talked earlier when we talked about the very first S, which is startup, 90% of businesses fail. Why do they fail? Well, because they're not really ready. They have a good idea, but they don't do all the things necessary. They're not testing their business plan. They're not finding their key KPIs. And, and honestly, a whole lot of businesses fail because they don't really have a process. They have this great methodology creating all this revenue, and then they fail to correct, collect the revenue. They didn't finish the plan. Hey, we did this great thing. How do we actually get the money? Okay, um, so 76% of owners are going to be transitioning in the next 10 years. Um, that, that number is a, is a somewhat stale number for me right now in the post-COVID environment. I think you've got a lot of baby boomers um, that are my age and a little bit older that have probably been beat up pretty good by COVID. And they're trying to figure out, should they go ahead and accelerate that plan? Um, however, of those 76, almost half have no idea what they're doing. Let's not be one of those, okay? Let's not be someone without a plan. Um, of the ones who go to, to market, 70% of it do not sell. Only 30% of businesses sell. So now that's a big number. It's another big number. These are staggering numbers. When we think of the American dream, which is to own your own home, own your own car, have your family, grow your family, sell your business. One of those big last pieces is just not happening. And then when you look at the next two, that only 30% of, of businesses transition. And of those 12% survive into the third generation. So we really have some work to do here. And the work we want to do is creating a plan that is a really good business plan. And that's what succession and sale is about. Bill, so uh, before you yeah. move on, by the way, everyone, uh, my name is Jordan. This is not Catherine with a very deep voice. That did not introduce <laughs> me. Um, 
Can you, so you said 70% of businesses do not sell. How often do you think that is um, owners maybe not knowing that their business is saleable when in reality it is versus businesses that aren't actually saleable? So believe it or not, this number is coming from the Exit Planning Institute. And this is a number of businesses that actually take themselves to the market. Okay. So these 70% of the businesses, great clarification, 70% of the businesses that make the decision to go to the market to sell themselves don't actually sell. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. They get to the market, they find out they're woefully prepared. They really don't want somebody coming in and beating them up about what has been their baby. There's a whole lot of different reasons, Jordan, but that is the number based off of uh, businesses actually going to market, not businesses that just close. Okay. Great. So good question. Good question. Um, so whoops. So exit planning is good business strategy. That's the big message here. Okay. And I'm going to explain why we're going to start deciding. We're going to start determining what is the enterprise value and what does that mean when we calculate um, what our business is worth? We've all heard of probably of EBITDA and some of the other key key numbers, but have we heard of enterprise value? And that's really the total value of the business. And this total value of the business is what's going to determine the multiple. Okay. Um, when we look at what succession planning does for us or exit planning, um, we are maximizing the transferable value. Remember when, when an owner decides to um, sell their business or transition it to the family member, we have to decide Believe it or not, it's as important to know if the owner is ready financially. Is the owner ready? And a lot of people could raise their hand right now and say, small business today, the owner's needs may impact the direction the company takes. It may be rather short-sighted, maybe too long-term, but the owner's needs are going to... So the owner preparedness is a big equation in your transition plan or your succession plan, which is just good business planning. So your business plan has to make sure your owner is ready. The last thing we wanna talk about a little bit is we're gonna start developing, well, what is coming next? Okay, what, what, what is coming next? Now at Hawk Cruise Associates, one of the things that we started doing because uh, I'm an old guy, right? We, we want Hawk Cruise Associates to become a firm of the future. So we're sharing knowledge. OK, we're trying to create client service at all levels. Um, we're setting up business member, uh, business mentalities, and we're setting those as key performance indicators at each level of our business. And we're trying real hard to make sure that we're not over reliant on single businesses. So we're trying to spread us out a little bit. It gives good, good industry focus, which will mean that after the, I am no longer needed, that, that there's still a legacy that can continue. And that's good for all of us. So that's the kind of transition that we're looking at here that we really want to make sure we're driving home. So once again, exit planning is just a really, really good business plan. So now we're going to start, we've got a couple of steps here. We're going to start talking about what is enterprise value. So there's really three phases in, in enterprise value determination. The first one is this discovery phase. Okay, we want to assess, we want to identify the risk areas of the business. Now, what is a risk area of business? It clearly over reliance on a single client. That can be a risk area. What's another risk area? Illiquidity in the marketplace. Maybe my AR, maybe my inventory isn't turning the way it should. Maybe my lockup days for the AR is too long. So those are those risk areas that we wanna identify. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna also likewise identify those growth areas. We're undercapitalized even though we could move into this market, we really can't right now. Or we are well capitalized and we could move into that market, we just haven't, we haven't focused on it, okay? So there's some focus there. Um, so that's in that business value discovery. Once again, personal financial. It's really important for our closely held businesses to make sure that our business owners are ready for transition and are put together in such a way so that the business is being generated or created for the maximum value of the business and not limited by the personal financial situation of the business owner. So what does the owner need? I had a conversation with a gentleman the other day who has a significant um, business value practice. And the, the takeaway that he said was, too often the business owner says, I have to get this number. 
And he says, why did you want that number? Because that's the number. I want to tell her, but I got it for that number. And then he always says the great thing. Well, what if it's not big enough? What if that number is not enough? Did you get that because you decided you determined what you needed to retire based on your desire for lifestyle? And too often that answer is no. Too often the answer is I just chose this number. We need to go into what the owner needs and we need to put it in a scale. Okay. This is where I'd like to be. This is where I must be. Okay. That gives me something to shoot for. Um, and we need to find out what are my owner weaknesses? Am I transitioning value? Am I transitioning knowledge? Am I transitioning client relationships? What am I doing there? So we, we have to identify both the business value and then the personal financial value. Now, of course, once we have those, it's time to create an action plan. Action plans are touchy. An action plan is something that we use to create lines in the sand. It's not a set formula. It's not formulaic. It is not concrete. It is the beginning. There's always a version one. Hey, the new action plan is this. Why would happen? But we found out something. We weren't there because, you know, it's, it's the famous thing from like several years ago when Congress passed the law and said, we have to pass the law so we can read it and see what's in it. Sometimes I have to put together a business valuation at which is the risk areas and the growth areas. Then I put together a personal financial valuation and find out where I have risk with the owner and the owner's needs. And those plans together then create an action plan, giving me the opportunity to go accelerate into that plan and see what happens next. And then I may need to change that action plan because, well, I'm a little long in the tooth here. I, I have to work on this piece a little bit different. So the action plan is a touchy thing it's something that's critical to be done, but we don't want to fool ourselves and think it, it's the end all. We will probably have to change it. Step one, we're discovering the value of the business. And what should come out of that is an action plan. Now, this is step two. We're preparing it. We're getting ready to go do what we have to do. So we're rectifying the weaknesses that we found in discovery. We're considering estate and tax considerations. We're looking at our after-tax cash flow, that kind of stuff. We're thinking about whether or not the need for buy-sell agreements are necessary if I have more than one partner, and certainly if I have minority partners, and certainly if I have family member partners. We're looking at contingency planning. Now, contingency planning takes all kinds of forms. Contingency planning is not just on contingency liability issues that may come because of debt situations, but contingency is also on major client concentrations. What do I do next? We're gonna identify the wants and needs, both of the business and obviously of the owner, okay? And then finally, we have to have some sort of a life after planning. What is the life after for Bill Cruzy? What does retirement really look like? So putting all those things together and allowing ourselves to start thinking about where we are is what is a big part of that personal and financial planning ownership piece. The next part in preparation is the business improvement. Now, what is business proven? Well, we've already talked about up here in the business value section, we've identified the risks, we've identified growth areas. Okay, so now in business improvement section, we're gonna come in here and we're gonna look at things like, well, should we be creating KPI models? At least one or two places. Let's get simple first, okay? Baby, baby steps. So we don't wanna go crazy here. We wanna do things that, that form success. And once we have success forming, then your team will immediately want to be a part of that success. So we have to be real careful with that. So we don't overwhelm ourselves. So KPI models. We want to look at our personnel. Now's a great time to look at our personnel. Are we upgrading our personnel? We want to make sure that the team members we're bringing in, either to replace team members or to help us grow the business, are going to be able to hit the KPIs that are set forth before them, those key performance indicators. And also are going to always remember that we have to serve the client. So those are two good values to think about when we're thinking of business, we're talking about personnel. Our business improvement is also going to be that strategic planning. Are there growth areas we need to go into? Are we too limited from a product focus perspective? Okay. There's a lot of times that ownership and especially team leaders will know that already. So putting together those plans with resources next to them will help us with the ultimate cash flow model. And then be able, obviously, at some point in time, your accounting guys are going to say, if we do this, this, and this, 
this is where we should be. And that's where we want to be, obviously. We just have to put together the cash flow needs, the capital needs to make sure we're getting there. Included in all business improvement, especially when we're thinking about a transition plan, has got to be management development. How are we improving our team? How are we preparing our team for the next level? Are we replacing ourselves? Are our team leaders replacing themselves? Are we growing as a, fee, as a team, as a person, as an individual, as a company? And that has to be a part of the preparation for transition. We will obviously look at our sales processes. And we will also look at, are we thinking as an owner or are we thinking as an employee? How are we thinking? Can we change those? All those together is part of that business improvement session. Now you're thinking right now, holy macro, this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And I'll tell you why in just a few minutes. It is so worth it. I believe that when we finish with this, you're going to say it's a lot of work. We're going to take bite sizes out of it, okay, though? You're not going to just do this overnight. You're going to say we're going to do A to Z in year one. No, it's probably a three-year transition. You know, if you're getting ready to transition, we want to work with this, work with you over the next three years. Um, get your team ready for it gradually. Get your business ready for it. You'll immediately start reaping the rewards, which is higher after-tax cash flow. And that's not a bad thing. So there is, there, although there is risk, there is great reward. Now, is the reward worth the value you put into it? And I'm going to say yes. And I think we've got plenty of cases to be able to show you that. So once we've done preparation for our personal and our business, now we start putting together those proofs of concepts. Now we're putting together the planning piece of it. Now, once again, back here, we started with our action plan. Now we developed the action plan. Now we have a master plan. So the plan, 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 right? Um, I think Sun Tzu says, um, the, an idiot with a plan will conquer a brilliant mind without a plan in every battle. So when we think of it from that perspective, um, so I may be the idiot, but I have a plan. So I have a pretty good, I, I have a pretty good shot, shot at being successful. Um, and that's what we want to do with that master plan. Catherine, I'll take a quick break. We're 18 minutes into it. We're about halfway through. Any questions that I need to, that it need to be uncovered? I don't have any questions right now, but if you do have something that you'd like Bill to answer, uh, just feel free to send me a chat or you can click on that Q&A uh, button at the bottom there and type your question there. All right, terrific. So we're gonna go on to that next slide. So this is the last step in maximizing our enterprise value. And this is the decision tree. So we've put together the plan and we're starting to act on the plan. Okay, that's what's coming out of step two. And like I say, three-year period. So if we get through step one, discovery, in the first, call it six months, then in about the next year, year and a half, we want to be in preparation and proof of concept and execution, okay? And in the last six to eight months, which obviously is more than three years, I get that. <laughs> in the last six to eight months, we're in the decision. Are we going to grow this? Are we going to transition it? Are we going to exit it? What do we want to do? Now, the brilliant part of this is that you now have options. Okay, that's the tenet of how Cruising Associates is. We want to present you with option, options for you to decide. Make that informed decision. Where do you want to go? Grow it, transition it, exit it. Which one do you want to do? And that puts you in an enviable position in the business community. So this decision phase um, takes away fear and allows you to be that educated decision maker. And so the maximize enterprise value or step three is the four, is taking it from the beginning all the way to the end. Now, obviously step four is we've decided to grow it. Well, we may need to start over with some of this planning pay phase, okay? We created a plan to get us to here. Now we may need to go over again. Transition will, will require a different kind of plan, but the great news now is We've created the processes and the SOPs so that transition can begin unfettered with other issues, right? And you'll always have issues. There is no, I guess I shouldn't use the word unfettered, but, but by the time we get to here, we are poised to accelerate in one direction or the other. So maximize the enterprise value. So now we've talked about the maximize the enterprise value. Remember the, mat, the, the enterprise value is the value of the whole thing together. You know, in the Charlie Sheen movie from many, many years ago, 
some things they talked about, and I think that was the power of money or greed, I don't remember which was, they talk about some things are worth more broken up. That's actually quite rare. It is the synergies of the things that we put together and the team inside that create the value, right? And so it's very rare for us to have a business that's best just split up, but it does happen. Um, so that's a fanciful movie. So value creation though, and acceleration is talking about EBITDA, enterprise value and after-tax cash flow. All the things that you've loved to hear me talk about for so many times. After-tax cash flow is my most favorite thing to talk about because without that, I cannot go anywhere, right? So, but with all those pulling together and each one of them, one may come off of the other. EBITDA, we may crank up EBITDA, but we may be a little worrisome on our after-tax cash flow because remember we've pulled depreciation out. So we wanna be aware of everything that we're doing and how they work together. And that's where value acceleration comes in. So now we're gonna give you an example. Hey, Bill, sorry. Yes. Before, you, before you go yeah. forward, we did a great question for two slides ago um, that I think would be helpful for to answer. What okay. would you say is the most important piece of information to make the decision to grow, transition, or exit? Like, how do you gauge that? That is a great question. When you get to this stage though, when you get to the decision stage, what, you, what will happen is you'll be tugged by all sides because when you're in the decision stage, your business is humming. It is at the top of its tier from an industry perspective. It is uh, creating the after-tax cash flow that you only thought you could do, and now you're exceeding and accelerating those and hitting those goals. So it's giving you a really tasty idea to say, do I, took, but do I put more capital behind this new methodology to grow and continue to reap the rewards of a well-run business? Or is this the perfect time for me to take a step back and transition or exit? And obviously, when you think of the pain in the very first in these other, okay, when I think of, of uh, the step two, sorry, I'm trying to get this to work. When I think of step two and step three, this is not a little bit of work, okay? This is a lot of work. When you get to step three, the rewards are coming. Um, many of our clients are in transition mode here. So a lot of them will do transition um, because they're thinking of bringing that family in or trusted team members in, people who have you know, earned their stripes, so to speak, um, and shown their worth. Um, a few of them will exit. There's no question about it. The kicker here that I find fascinating is when, when we implement these steps and this kind of a plan, um, I'm not going to say fewer people exit because they've, they, they've realized the value and they've They've realized the way to de-stress their lives and take the risk out of their personal life and their business life, and they do go hand in hand. Um, and, and too often I find people that are exiting are just worn out. You know, they fought the good fight, so to speak. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. I, so I can't necessarily say um, where everybody would go because it is depending on a whole, so many family, th family matters, and it is about the owners. Um, but I do think, I think most of them at that, at that size right now are in the transition um, uh, kind of phase. So hopefully that answers that question. Anything else, Catherine? Great, thank you. No, nope, so that was it. Okay, so we're gonna throw up here. This is a, this is a real example. Um, of course, all the names are hidden, et cetera, but this is a real example. And these are the last three years. Now this does not include 2020. So obviously the, da the data is a little bit stale. But revenue for this company has been growing for the last three years, okay? Uh, gross profit has been growing for the last three years. Uh, net income, kind of not so much, kind of all over the place. EBITDA, yeah, looks good, not too bad. Um, but when you, if you start identifying um, the different interrelationships of this, standard EBITDA uh, for a, a, a closely held company with 100 million in revenue should be three to four. Okay, so those are things to just start thinking about. Um, so when we start thinking about my different companies, standard EBITDA for an engineering company should be five to six. You can just put this in your pocket and start thinking about it. Um, the opportune multiple or EBITDA multiple for a manufacturing entity is six to eight, okay, depending on how much bigger you are. Um, we should be looking at gross profit for most of these 
somewhere in the 40s, but for this company, it's hovering between 34, 39, 37. Those are the most profit numbers. And net income is a paltry 5% in two years and 2% in the last year. Um, and these are all good numbers and good percentages to be thinking about when we think about where is our opportunity and what is this kind of data telling us um, about, about the opportunity that we have to create a plan to start at the beginning, identify the, identify the risks, let's de-risk, create the plan to grow it to then have a decision tree. So we're gonna use these numbers um, as we start considering doing it. Now, here's what we know about this company. So they have a very- Really, yes. quick, would you say the importance there is, you know, I as an outside buyer, I would see this and I would say, look, the net income is flat or decreasing. When in reality, the, the picture that could be painted is this company is capitalizing and that's why EBITDA is increasing. So is the importance of getting into the detail of these numbers, the ability to tell the correct story versus just letting the numbers speak for themselves? Yeah, absolutely. It's always about the story, right? We want to be the first one to tell the story. You know, so if you think about it, what I'm fascinating, I was talking to this, this client the other day, and what I'm fascinated, I can't wait to see the 2020, the 2020 numbers in their fullness. You know, looking at them throughout the year, we're seeing where they are. And what I've sensed is we've been in this growth mode, you know, and how many of us were focusing on revenue, we're focusing on revenue. What are we not focusing on? You know, you've heard me say a dog on the hunt doesn't know he has fleas. Well, the flea is expensive. OK, and so we're focusing on revenue and revenue is doing what I want. Ah, Expenses are kind of following revenue. We're not getting any any flat line there with those expenses. Our project D, our project management detail isn't giving us the key indicators that we need to make other decisions. Right. And that's what I'm reading here. And I'm thinking what I'm seeing from their 2020 numbers and saw in 2020 was a, a maturation phase. OK, and in that maturation phase of business planning, we go, whoops, looks like we're hitting our targets up here. Let's slow down that top line just a little bit, curve it over just a little bit so we can get a handle on those expenses. You know, and, and you're right, Jordan, that's when we're getting into the details to see what's going on with this business um, that's going to drive ourselves the other way around. Now, net income is after depreciation. So you're right. I mean, we've got some inventory numbers and some capital numbers in here we have to be aware of. That EBITDA number is quite telling, though. Because the EBITDA number, remember, we're pulling out of it. You know, they're not intensely debt. They're paying for a lot of things with cash flow, but there's a lot of depreciation that's coming back out of there. And the EBITDA normally right size depreciation. So that EBITDA number is telling me I'm really concentrating on growth. I'm really concentrating on revenue and I'm really not paying attention to my expenses. So that's what I'm learning. That's what I'm seeing from these. And, and this next slide is kind of the proof in the pudding. Because when we look at this slide here, this is about the company itself, okay? And we, what we see, so back to Jordan's point, I'm a company, uh, I'm, I'm on the outside and I'm looking in, okay? So we, we say that the company looks at itself from the inside out and from the outside in. And from the inside out, how do we feel? What are we doing? What are we projecting? And that's where we go to, well, we have low company documentation. Our owner planning is a little low. We're kind of reactionary. Uh, not proactionary or proactive. <laughs> uh, we're not really training a lot of management. Um, we're very centralized in our decision-making process, which that doesn't mean that's bad. But we do have some great things outside looking in. Customer alliances, alliances are very high. Um, we have uh, terrific internet sales. So we've got decent brand value on some part. I put down no brand value because some parts of it have no brand value. They're very in the commoditized business, but they really have a couple of places that are really strong in, in brand value. So there's the good and the bad here, looking outside, looking inside. But right now we have no transition planning, no planning for unknowns. We have low job costing methods. Um, cost and project management controls are low. That's all we know. We're not focusing on expenses. That, you know, revenue is going up and expenses are going with them. So we have some good stuff. We have some things we need to clean up. And that's, this, that's the middle phase. The first phase is going to identify this stuff and help us identify then what do we need to do to de-risk and to start planning. Let's go get a hold of the owners and see what they need. And let's put this thing together. Because this company has absolutely phenomenal opportunity. So here we are, 17, 18, and 19. Same slide you've seen before, OK? We've already talked about this slide. So we go to the next slide. Oh, where am I? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way with my arrows. So here's what we do here with this one. 
And I apologize for that. So here's where we were. These de details of the company give me an assessment of what the value of the company is, okay? We've looked at their numbers. They're telling me that they're focusing on growth, not focusing on expenses. We know that the company isn't really in that planning mode. They have a lot of good things going. They have some things that need to be cleaned up. And this is what that drives. So we have a fairly low enterprise value. Remember, the enterprise value is what I'm selling. It's what I'm giving to the next person. So we have a lack of process planning and owner readiness. So from the outside looking in, it depends on what they have that that outsider may be looking at. So if I'm a upstream, someone that, that is in the business and really wants what they have, they probably have some wonderful things that they would want. Website is phenomenal. You know, they have these really strong alliances within the industry. Um, so then they do have some really strong brand value on some of their products. So some great things from the outside looking in. So you could look at this and go, man, I could turn this thing around. Okay. My EBITDA 1.3 is seven. Multiple is only three. Now, just so that we know, 80% of businesses traded a four multiple or lower. 80% of businesses traded a four multiple or lower. Why? Uh, 80 or 90% of businesses are sold by accountants. We like even numbers. Ask anybody. I round up and so I can use big numbers so I don't mess up the math. So, I, and that's my oversimplified method. So there's not a lot of science here, but in this company, it's worth about 3.9 million. If I'm an owner, it's worth about 3.9 million. I'm cranking out 600 a year. Why wouldn't I just run it until it's done? That, that's a really good question. You know, it really depends on how old you are when you make that decision, right? If I'm 75 or 80, it's time for me to go ahead and take the big number. If I'm 60, run it for a few more years. That's probably where I am right here. But now let's talk about what happens if we clean up some things. Okay, what, what can happen um, when we can clean up some things? What if we create management training? What if we go ahead and identify our process manual by job? What if we accelerate the, the, the customer alliances and be, begin cross-selling? Okay. Now that cross-selling, a lot of people say, oh, that cross-selling, I mean, it can, it can. I mean, you have to do it right. Everything in this world is you can either do it right or you cannot do it. Those are your two options. Don't do halfway, um, but do it right or do it or, or don't do it at all. Now, if my owner readiness is also now high and I'm planning, I started tracking the management and my product sales and my costs with project management tools. Uh, this company transforms itself. Um, now, what we'll be do, able to do in the next few months is we've actually got some case studies of clients where we have done this. And this one is one that, that I'm eager to and hoping that they do do this. But with these kind of elements in place, we have a brand new company. Now, what I've done here is extrapolated their growth curve. Okay. I'm not trying to get too fancy here, all right? I'm just saying this is where revenue is growing. This is what it's doing. You can see in 21, 22, that year one, year two, you can see that I've kind of taken a little bit of step. I've, I've curved it a little bit more, right? Because the fact of the matter is, if we go into this into 21, we're going to need to take some pressure off of sales in order to get our arms around the other things that are happening. Now, we already have the, you know, so in the small business, we'll tell you all the time, man, if you got a sale, you got to make the sale. There's too much competition out there. No question about that. That is something we have to be prepared to answer. But this company with that really strong internet presence and these really good customer alliances and product alliances with just a little more work, I think we can curve the sale without losing the momentum that we've already created. Okay, remember in 17, there were 12 million. Okay, four years, double. So, so I don't think that this places the company at risk. Now, obviously, the owners will tell us this. Now, so, what does that happen to? Yes. Oh, sorry. Just um, is there? Would you say there's a? Is there an age of a business or an owner where outside buyers are less likely to purchase a business? You're talking about kind of finding that sweet spot between: Do I walk away? Do I sell it now? Like, would you say that there's? an age of the owner or business where, where people are more likely to walk away? So, okay, that's a great question. So let's look at the fundamentals of most owners. So, and, and so 
the owner is probably going to walk away if at 65 they've just been slogging it out and they're just trying to get to that number. A lot of people have in their mind at 65, I can retire. Um, so somewhere in that 62, 63 <clears throat> to go to someone who's ready to retire and say, I really think this will make sense if you did this, I think um, that would be a tough sell. I think if I'm 50 years old and I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about this, it's 15 years from when that magical 65 year is, my 50 year olds, my 55 year olds, and certainly my 58 year olds, once I get in that 60 and above, definitely should be looking at this, but time is time is, is slipping past us to get us. And why not? I mean, if I'm 50 years old and I can do, if my company can do what we're saying it can do, why am I waiting 10 years to go reap the extra cash flow? Just doesn't make sense. Right now, this company is at 600,000 in cash flow. Look at my EBITDA number here, 2 million. What am I waiting on? Why, why am I not doing this immediately? Because the proof's in the pudding, right? So I think that once you're in that 63, 64 years old, it's really tough. At 70s, um, it's really tough to create a change in, enough of a change in the business to get enough traction because there's a lot of ingrained things at 70. Now that's, you know, I don't want to pick on someone who's 70 years old and hungry, um, but, you know, in general, in general. Um, I think that's probably it. Now, I would I would sprinkle in there <clears throat> that the art of the deal, not to no reference to the to the to the book, but just that term, the art of the deal. No matter what business you're selling, if you have decided to go to market, let's go to market properly. We have to tell our story. We want to clean up the thing, the books as much as possible. We certainly don't want any glaring mistakes, right? Um, and then we want to think of structure, structure, structure so that we hit the maximum after-tax cash flow for that, for that family. So I think that's key. Um, um, anybody who has a company that has something going and is making money should certainly be consider selling their business and not just walking away from it. If for no other reason, you have, you have team members, you have family members, that are that are wanting you to stay in business because they you know they're making a living and they like their job so maybe we do a company buyout maybe we do an employee buyout um, there's some great opportunities with with uh, employee buyouts so a lot of good options there at no place would i ever say to an owner you're really too old just walk away that is never going to come out of my lips and i just said the word never so it'll probably come out of my lips but but i would say it would be an incredibly rare situation for me to actually think it should come out so Good question. Any other questions, Catherine? Uh, we don't have any right now, but like I said before, feel free to send me a chat or um, use the Q&A function at the bottom yep. of the screen. Awesome. So uh, we're 40 minutes into it. We're just about done, folks. So if you have questions, please don't, don't hesitate to ask them. If you want to copy the slides or anything, or you want us to follow up with anything, please do uh, give us a buzz. Uh, HK would love to help you or your client. Um, with this uh, method. Um, so, and I'm gonna go back to this now. So here's what we are. We were, we were decent, we were very centralized. We're starting to decentralize. We're starting to invest in our processes. We're starting to look at our project management. Uh, we're starting to create KPIs. We're starting to do the things that are in that level two, that second level when we've figured out what we need and now let's implement it. And this is absolutely usable. This is absolutely achievable. And these are the kind of numbers that we've seen with some of our other clients. Uh, EBITDA is on the rise, okay? Um, it's, it's growing at a great pace. We have a nice clip, net income is higher. Remember that EBITDA number is the number, right? And so what a company transformed like this looks like is completely different than the company we looked at before, that now my enterprise value is high because the business is ready. We have a process. We have already done the planning. Our owners are ready. We've, we've taken a big rise in our EBITDA, 2.5 versus 1.3. That's called value acceleration. 2.5 from 1.3, so that's a million two. Well, not only did I get a million two, so before if it was at three times, Okay, that million two increase would be $3 million in my pocket more than it was. But what happens is when I increase EBITDA, that's the value acceleration. 
EBITDA makes me skip into a different multiple. Now I'm at a six multiple. That's the value acceleration. That's where the payoff comes. It's because not only am I getting a better EBITDA, which means that for the last three years, I've had higher and better after-tax cash flow that I've put to use either back in the business, in my family, in my team, in my community, wherever I want to. Okay, but now I've skipped the multiples. I'm at a six multiple, which is achievable, but not too common. So when you go to the club and you say, I sold my business for a six, depending on your business industry, people are going to pay attention to that. How in the world did you do that? We did the value, ex value acceleration model. We called HKA and we said, we want to do this. Okay, we're going to make the commitment. So clearly we've got, we're going from a three and a half million dollar value to a $15 million value. And that's the result of concentrating on the things that we've talked about, especially in the, in the second stage when we put that plan together and we create the processes internally, enabling us to skip from a three multiple to a six multiple. So that's a, that is what the, the transition, the succession planning, the sale too often we say, succession planning and people think, I'm not sure I want to sell my business. No, no, no. Succession planning is a really good business plan. It's preparing you to look at the options you have in front of you. Do I grow it some more? Do I go in a new direction? Do I transition? Now I have the ability to transition or do I exit completely? So once again, succession planning is very good business planning. Um, when we increase our enterprise value, and this is really important, not only am I putting more after-tax cash flow in my pocket, but I'm also including, I'm skipping multiples. That's the key. I'm going from that standard three or four multiple. I'm getting in the fives and sixes. And that is an amazing difference in the amount of after-tax cash flow I have to do whatever I want to. Maybe I do a charitable plan. Maybe I'm helping my other family members. Maybe I'm helping the community. Maybe whatever I'm doing, maybe I'm, I'm uh, doing a company buyout. But now you have the options to do what you want to do. Um, and those are all the key reasons uh, to adopt this type of a plan. HK is here, re here ready to get started. Um, I am a SEPA. Um, so we spent a lot of time on this stuff and helping our small business clients achieve their goals um, through options. We want to give you those options. Uh, Catherine, any last questions? Bill, I don't know if you've explained what a SEPA is. So you might would just like for- Oh, I'm sorry. A SEPA yeah. is a Certified Exit Planning Advisor. Um, and it's a designation through training, kind of like a CPA, but not quite as intense. Um, and what basically what it does is it's someone who's, who's been, who's done the courses and gotten the licensure um, to offer this kind of advice. So yeah, Jordan's going to be taking the exam this summer. Um, so HKNA will be um, ready to help you get started. Catherine, yeah, you're getting I, ready to say something? Oh yeah, I was just going to clarify that you weren't calling yourself a Sherpa that in fact you were. <laughs> not a Sherpa. I am not a Sherpa. That's good. <laughs> All right. So this is, that's the end of our seminar series. We're right shy of 45 minutes. I want to thank everybody for taking time with us today. Uh, next webinar series is going to be on your why. Any last questions, Catherine? Nope, but if you'd like a copy of the slides, just feel free to reach out to us at the office. Um, you can send me a chat if you'd like to, if you're still on, um, or you can send the office an email. Thanks. Absolutely. Jordan, anything from you? Nope, I'm good. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week, weekend. Bye now.